Welcome to the Fitness Fest podcast. My name is Tyler Valencia and I'm the president of Kips and Time to Train Fitness. We have a fit pro together with us on this episode. She's seen it all, been in the industry for a long time, but done great work as an independent business owner, doing new things, progressing, all these kinds of things that she's going to share with you. We have Eileen Sharon on the podcast. Eileen, thank you for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Nice of you to have me today. Yes, yes. Let's kick it off with the same question that everybody gets. That is your story within the fitness industry. Can you give us a little background on Eileen? Sure. I, uh, I actually started as a dance teacher. I was an assistant dance teacher at age 14 and then ended up getting my own classes at age 16. And I was teaching probably four or five classes a week to about 20 to 25 people. And um, the business owner, the lady who owned the dance studio, uh, was interested in starting an aerobics class. And I decided that I wanted to jump on the trend because it was a really interesting trend at the time. And I was about 19 years old. And so I did a little research. There was a training going on called aerobics basic training. And it was in this big, huge hangar at a university. Mm -hmm. And I took this class and got an idea of the concept of how aerobic fitness started to feel and come together. And I started teaching adult classes at the studio. Soon after I was performing, I was um, actually a dancer for Henry Mancini. You probably don't know him because you're too young, but he was the guy who wrote Pink Panther. And I was doing some professional dancing just to get help me afford college and, and, and also teaching dancing at the same time. And um, someone saw me in a performance and came to the studio and asked me if I have any experience with aerobics. And I said, well, I've been teaching for a little bit, but um, what's it, what do you have in mind? He goes, well, I'd like to launch a teacher training for all the racquetball worlds. Would you take, teach, you know, 30 to 40 instructors kind of a protocol? Did more research. Uh, I w- was in school for health administration, so I got some ideas to do my research at the library. And I came up with a protocol of a warm up, standing arm work, uh, standing leg work floor work, abdominal work, butt work, and then a stretch. And so we, that was basically my first big gig presenting was presenting to about 35 aerobics instructors, a criteria for aerobics. And then I taught at a little studio called the exercise company. Uh, That club launched Karen Voigt, who's a, was a huge name at the time and some other people. And it was uh, a lot of celebrities took class there like Helen Hunt. And it was owned by Valerie Bertinelli and Van Halen at the time. And I taught there for five years and started off with a one class late at night and built my repertoire and my following. And um, then moved to Chicago and taught there and then came back to California and continue to teach. So I've been teaching for about 42 years. Wow. <laughs> Long time. Long time. Seasoned. Yeah. Vet, veteran of the industry. And one of the questions I always like giving guests on the podcast is about what was the industry like at certain points, seeing that I consider myself one that enjoys learning about the fitness industry. And we always talk about how young it is, how things are still evolving. What were things like in that period when you were 14, 16 years old? Was there education? Was there certifications, workshops, anything like that? Well, actually, there wasn't a lot of education at the time. I think I got my ACE certification in 87, and it had been around for a a couple of years. But interestingly enough, when I started, it was leg warmers and G-strings. And (laughs) you you were watching other people to see what the trends were. But Mm. if you if you knew anything about fitness at that era, it was high impact aerobics. That's all Mm. that, that was offered. So the interesting thing about our industry, as it progressed, one format at a time got introduced. So maybe after the aerobics, some people started doing handheld weights. I was one of the first people who did a video. Um, it was it was called the 29 minute total body toner. And it was produced by the same guy who did the original Jane Fonda's and nobody had ever been using handheld weights in the class. But I decided since I had that option teaching at night, I would throw that in. And it sold millions and millions and millions of copies. And I got 250 bucks. So it was <laughs> not a great deal for me, but a great experience working with him. Mm-hmm. But it really our industry has evolved one format at a time 
we got after that, it was low impact aerobics because a lot of people couldn't bounce around. The step became a therapeutic uh, class that started in the industry, but then evolved into a very highly choreographed class. There was the slide, which was basically a plastic board that you went side to side and had to put booties on. Mm -hmm. Then there were circuit classes that were incorporated, boot camps. So kickboxing, really our industry evolved one format at a time. We didn't have 50 different formats to choose from. Mm -hmm. So that definitely makes things a little bit more difficult for the newcomers in our industry, but it was a slow process. And as more instructors hit the industry, everyone realized that we need some kind of basic ground rules and physiological approach to this whole new way of exercising. And so there, I actually posted a few weeks ago, a Reebok, uh, a Reebok article, because there was a, a magazine that was launched to help instructors understand specific basic things like abdominal work and stress on the neck or proper positioning for leg work. So there was a slow transformation of education, but certifications didn't come around till in the eighties. Oh, wow. And wow. then one, again, one at a time, Very fast Maybe ACE, then AFA, then ACSM, then NF, they all started when the perspective started to change and there were different interests. Mm -hmm. That's when we started getting a whole bunch of different certifications. Really fascinating stuff there, just to know how and when, all that kind of stuff for anybody that wants to be in the industry or even has been in the industry. I'm sure that they've had these questions as well. So it's always great to hear from somebody that had to go through that, had to go through this process of what certifications do I need? Is this required at this time? I'm sure there were periods of your career where things weren't required and all of a sudden the year next year changes. Okay. Now I have to get this certification. And for myself, I remember being in school and having to have these conversations with the professor and the, my professor, one of them is, uh, she's widely known within the industry. Her name's Dr. Jan Schroeder. She mm -hmm. know, had Jan. this conversation with us about licensure. I remember distinctly this conversation and I remember she was talking about some of the research about it and states trying things out and her even saying how you know this is something that you guys will have to deal with in the future talking about licensure states and the requirements and so just hearing the evolution throughout the time of the industry of our, our young industry it's always great stuff to learn and see how things went and how potentially instructors can deal with this as it evolves for themselves um yeah, there, there were no there were no certifications or education in college mm -hmm. that you could get a degree in, let's say, sports science or yeah. that really didn't that didn't occur too much later. So if you were asked to get a certification, it was usually from your club, your home club. Like mm -hmm. one of my clubs, I remember requiring an AFA certification. One of my club wanted um, an A certification. So basically you would get the certification that you were home based at the club so that you could can not only get maybe a higher pay grade because of it, or that the club was able to say our instructors are all certified. Mm -hmm. And then the progression from there was to you get insurance. Do we need insurance as, as ind independent contractors? And are we considered full-time or part-time? Um, all of that becomes very, very complex, yeah. but it, it was all about the slow progression of what an instructor needed to qualify for their job wherever they were in the country. Yeah, yeah. And I remember when I started in the industry and the gym that I worked at, large facility, 35 to 40 trainers, and some of them full-time. And those full-time requirements were not, we'll say, typical of other industries. That X amount of sessions they had to complete to reach that full-time to get benefits. Mm -hmm. Because our industry is different. It's not a, yes. you punch in nine to five, <laughs> go to work, sit at a desk, you might have, you typically do have early morning clients, you come back. And so finding what that does mean for a business has been an evolution for a lot yeah. of, of instructors, fitness instructors. So always very interesting to hear. Eileen, what do you think about the last year? Can you share how the fitness industry changed and even how share a little bit about yourself, how you evolved? I think forever our industry has changed from this uh, COVID experience. Uh, I do feel that no matter what happens in the future, 
everyone will have to think of a hybrid system, not only when it comes to work, but when it comes to fitness as well. You're going to need an online social media presence. And you absolutely, if you love working uh, in person with people, you should continue to because you do get different feedback working one on one or in groups or face to face that it's going to be different than online. Um, I, in, in all my years in this industry, I decided when I was going to go into fitness, my goal was to try and earn a living full time. So you have to become entrepreneurial when you're doing that. You have to recognize opportunities when they're thrown at you. You have to get the right amount of either education or do the a right amount of work to head you in that specific direction or research. And so for me, being able to survive not only COVID, but my age, um, changing different parts of the country because trends were different when I was living a couple of years in Chicago versus Orange County versus Los Angeles. I think you need to be adaptable. You need to be resilient and you need to recognize your opportunities and make sure that you do your homework. All of that is still the same in our industry. This won't be the last um, challenge that fitness individuals will have to go through. It's it's a good test, but um, we've we've had a lot of different experiences during the years. We went from small studios to very large gyms to outdoor training to indoor training. So most people, if they want to be successful for the future, they have to think adaptable, resilient and always look for a new opportunity if they want to become a true fitness entrepreneur and make a living at this industry. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that perspective. And I like that even you're saying that this is something that's always going to affect our, or that it's going to continue to affect our industry and our industry has always changed. And I think it's evolving. Really, yep. Yeah. It, it's evolving. And I think the individuals that understand that, I mean, I feel like I saw instructors in the last six, eight months, okay, things are going back to normal. Okay. Everybody ready to go back and things along that line. And for me, I saw a lot of instructors that had a big increase in their business and almost took, uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to say it, they took a hold of their career. And yeah. I can't tell you how many people I've known through the industry through the years that just share stories about how they were getting overrun by their gym or just being worked nonstop, bad work situations. And so mm -hmm. all of a sudden this thing happened within our the whole world globally where things shut down, but instructors found a way to almost take a, a handle of their own lives, their own careers. Yep. And I always thought it was just great. I thought it was fantastic to hear and see those types of stories. And it's one of those things where it created another aspect of your business. If you yeah. hustled and you created this new avenue for your business, you evolved. And now you're continuing as things do semi go back to a part where things are in person, more power to you more power to you. Yeah. Taking advantage yes. of a situation as opposed to looking at as a hindrance. For example, yeah. um, I was hired at one point and I've had a lot of stories like this, but I'll just give you a quickie. I was hired uh, by balance bar during my years of competitive training. I was in competitive aerobics. It was the national aerobic championships. It was the crystal light aerobic championships. It was the ultimate um, competitive environment for aerobics instructors. And so I was in the top four doing a lot of choreography for everybody, started working with Balance Bar, saw that there was a niche for children for nutrition bars, uh, did a study, found out that 17% of all bars were eaten by children because parents who are healthy were giving their kids bars. And then I developed a nutrition bar for children. Same thing. You have to in our industry, if you end up being in a certain situation where you see an opportunity, take advantage of the opportunity. Same thing with social media. You have an opportunity to meet, to reach people all over the world for the first time. And how can your expertise uh, thrive with that opportunity that you have to really step, take a step back and look at that. And don't think that you can always go back because fitness, if you, if you look at our history, we don't go back. It, there's, it's ever changing. Yes, there mm -hmm. might have been yoga 20 years ago, but now yoga is seen differently. Yes, mm -hmm. there might have been um, resistance training 25 years ago, but it's different than it was yeah. 25 years ago with all the, the, the more functional training and a combination of traditional and functional. So if, if 
if someone can really think about how to keep moving forward and not thinking backwards, because thinking backwards in our industry is, I think, just a death mark. <laughs> it's just not helpful. <laughs> yes, agree, agree, a hundred percent. Eileen, let's let's learn a little bit more about yourself. Let's learn a little more about Eileen. Did you find it difficult at different points to get your business started? I know that you've had a few, uh, including the Omniball. Did you ever find that process difficult for yourself? Oh, every single project, article, workshop. Um, I'm not saying it's all difficult, but it's all work. Mm -hmm. I, I consider it work. And um, moving, I think, was there was moments in my life when I moved from that studio in, in the Valley that was owned by Valerie Bertinelli. It was I was five years at one studio that was a pretty long time in fitness and developed mm -hmm. a community and then moved to Chicago, Chicago. Nobody knew me. And I started from scratch, had to build a business there. And what I realized is that there was no personal training going on in it there at the time. And so mm -hmm. I would do a full service um, personal training. I also taught at a gym. So I taught classes, but I did manis, petties, cooked for my clients and did massage. Wow. So I would be there for two or three hours. I would optimize my time and do really well. But then when I left Chicago and moved back to Orange County, I went from a really high paycheck to a ridiculous paycheck. I, I don't know, even know if I can tell you how bad it was. <laughs> Let's put it this way. It was like a 250% decrease in my, oh. in my years. It was terrible. Uh, started from scratch in Orange County. And those moments where you are reinventing yourself can be very challenging. When I developed my Omniball, my, my product that was really, I developed it for my dad for therapeutic pur purposes because he was doing some stupid shoulder therapy after he couldn't lift a glass and he also had a knee replacement. So I developed this product, the Omniball, it's going to be at Fitness Fest. Um, it was really difficult because I had never made a product before mm -hmm. and uh, I had to research how to get it produced any of the specific information, the patent, the, uh, any of the IP, you know, all of the intellectual property, which I'd never done before. So every project that I take on, I have to say that there's always going to be a difficult path, but if you are passionate about it and you see that the possibilities, you just keep going down the path until that red light goes on. So all throughout my career, I've headed in different directions. I've I've created products. I've created new programming like Myofast Release was the first person to present Myofast Release at Idea in 2003. I did it because I needed it, but then I did the research and brought it to the industry. So again, it's all about adaptability, where your head is being turned and the opportunity that you see mm -hmm. and trying to make the best out of that opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. Did you ever always feel like you had that entrepreneurial spirit? I, I feel it. I can hear it right now coming through. Did you always have that growing up? <laughs> yes, I did. I, uh, I remember I was, uh, my first like thrill of selling something. <laughs> I was uh, six years old and my friend invited me. She's my best friend in nursery school to a local, it's like a garage sale. And she had a little booth and she did macrame. She was doing macrame for pots. And I was doing these little clay characters. And I had all my like 10 little characters out on the table. And this lady bought like five of them for like her five kids. And I made, I don't know, it was like a dollar fifty or something <laughs> like that. And I just was super thrilled that I made a sale. And I have to say that uh, I'm still thrilled over, over a sale of something that somebody really needs and really expresses an interest in and that it's going to do good for them. I, uh, I tried to create, um, when I was 20 years old, I traveled through Europe by myself and I came back home and I said to my dad, I said, I want to, I want to bake these giant pretzels and import mustard from all the world. And I'm going to, I trademarked it bread souls, B R E A D bread souls. <laughs> And he goes, you're crazy. I'm not going to give you $20,000 to buy <laughs> ovens for a pretzel company. 
no one's going to eat pretzels. And then three or four years later, they were in every mall Mm -hmm. and and airport in the country. But I couldn't earn them. I couldn't find the money because no one would loan $20,000 to somebody who wasn't, you know, even graduated from college. So I did that. And I did a kid sport nutrition bar for my children. I've also uh, proposed software for companies. I've done the Omniball. I'm constantly looking for really intriguing products that will meet the needs and help people in a significant way. So, yeah, I think I've had that spirit for a long time. I kind of look at fitness the same way is if I see something that's lacking in our industry. Several years ago, I developed a workshop called Flexibility Fast because nobody was really doing enough flexibility training and understanding how important it was to cross train flexibility. And so I focused on that for a while. So every couple of years, I get a little an itch and Mm -hmm. I'll focus on that for a while. And when that's met and I've completed my tasks, I move on to the next uh, thrill. I dig it. I dig it a lot. I love the entrepreneurial conversations that come through this podcast or just it, talking with anybody within the industry about what they're doing. And, Cause you hear the passion, you hear the pat every single one of those that you just talked about, you could just hear it coming through your voice. And even uh-huh. though it's something that not everybody has, you can tell that the passion lives within you. And I actually want to jump more into the Omni ball. Can you talk a little bit more about that? We've talked about it off the podcast before. Can you share a little bit sure. more about it? Well, as I mentioned, I developed it for my dad. It was a pasta colander, a big tennis ball, a screw and a bike strap. Mm -hmm. And um, again, I developed it because I was watching him doing some of his therapy for his shoulder and his knee. And they were giving him these little drills that didn't seem to make a difference. And for months and months and months, he suffered. So I said, you know what, I'm going to rig something up. I loved fitness tubing. So I thought about doing a little bit of that. Um, And so after I assembled this little, I had my friend help me build this prototype. I had him doing compression exercises because I read that if you, for shoulders, if you don't lift, but you compress the inner workings of the shoulder, it helps the stabilizers and makes the shoulders much stronger. So I had him doing these range of motion stabilizing exercises on the table and then eventually on the wall. And then when he, two months later was, completely functional. Both he and I were kind of shocked. So that's when one of my students had um, a vacuum a vacuum cleaner company. And he said, I have a manufacturer in China. Would you want to reach out to him? And I said, yes. Mm-hmm. Seven prototypes later, I got the Omni ball put together. It was in stainless steel and handmade with a bocce ball because a bocce ball was the cheapest thing that I could use to weight the item. And I wanted to weight it. Mm-hmm. And I started testing it and playing with it and then realized, oh, my gosh, I could put it on my hands. I could put my feet. I can use it on the table. I can use it on the wall. And I got the opportunity to test and do classes at um, UC Irvine. John Halsey, who was the manager at my at the time, said, yeah, bring those suckers in. Mm-hmm. Let's have the kids play with them. And then there was a back wall that was padded so I can do wall work. And two years after using that product, I said, I got, I got to do this. This is crazy how strong people have become using this product. And that's when I uh, launched the Omniball. I dig it. I dig it. For those listening, can you kind of paint a picture of what the Omniball looks like and how it's used? Sure. It's imagine a, an un- underarm deodorant roller. <laughs> since it rolls or a little massage tool that rolls and it's got a casing where your hand slips into a uh, soft strap and it's ergonomic so your hands are comfortable so even when you're doing push-ups you can edge it on its side and keep your wrists comfortable because there's a lot of complaints about that as well so it all it's omnidirectional so what does that mean it's got ball bearings in it and has no linear limitations so you can roll it in every single direction. You can tilt it and put it on the housing for stability. You can use it on your hands and you can use it on your feet, which there's no other item in in the world that is used as a weighted foot device that rolls like this. So it gives you hip mobility function for um, stabilization when you edge it and is a weight at the very end of your lever. So even if you put an ankle weight on, you'd have to put that ankle weight at the end of the foot for it to equate the feeling of the Omni ball and they come in both two pounds for more like yoga and therapy and four pounds for people who want to just get their butt kicked. What I'm imagining in my head is so times that I've gone to physical therapy, even though I am 
on the younger side in the industry. I have been to physical therapy several times for shoulder injuries mostly. And I'm mm-hmm. imagining some of the drills I've done, wall drills, and the weighted yeah. aspect, that being a great tool for strengthening through these instead of just doing body weight and evolving through those. Then at the same right. time to try to, and please correct me if I'm wrong on this, that if almost imagining doing ab rollouts, but in multiple um, hand positions. And correct. that's one of the biggest things I think that is growing is the uh, multi-planar movements within the industry as people learn about them and the benefits of them. So imagining doing uh, prone multi-planar movements with these yes. weighted balls for a, a vast a variety of exercise right there. I just, my mind is just growing right now. Going crazy. Of, yeah. Know, like Trust the me, the more you there. use them, the more you use them, the more things you can do with them and think of it this way. You're not only rolling out and in like an abril or any of those casters that people have where it's flat, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you have that, um, rolling completely in a circle. So it's omnidirectional on the ball. So even if you roll out, if you turn your hands in or out a little bit, the stabilizers of the shoulders work differently. So you can put it on one hand and the same foot and work that way. You can put it on Um, both hands, you can put on both feet, or you can work it on the oppositional hand and foot. So the it's limitless as far as creating instability and range of motion on all those small, small muscles that are stabilizers. It's It's just so much fun for anybody who has a physical therapy background or great biomechanics. When they start playing with them, it's mind blowing. It's not just bilateral rollout Mm -hmm. you can you can roll out but do circles as you go out and circles as you come in (laughs) it's just crazy i I dig it i'm excited to try these at fitness fest coming up it's something that my mind just starts rolling on it and i just start thinking of those possibilities of it so i'm excited for that uh, to see these put them on my hands. I've seen you share about them in different recordings and seen you use them a couple of times just with a little bit of work uh, that I do with Fitness Fest. So this will be great. Eileen, Fun. let's continue ch- chatting now about yourself. So we've talked about education before. You've already mentioned education a few times in this. What is your educational background and how have you used education as part of your career to grow? Well, I didn't get my degree in in fitness. It, health administration was the direction I went, which I would never, ever work in a hospital now. I mean, it was just a miserable time. Uh, I, I do attend a lot of conferences. I present at a lot of conferences. So I'm constantly taking other people's sessions to, to see what other people are doing. Um, if, again, I find an area that's really interesting to me, like myofascial release, there was a lot of study involved in that. Janet Travell, who was the first female physician in the White House for Kennedy, and she stayed on for Johnson. I read her papers when I started to develop the techniques for myofascial release. And it was a long study because she had a lot of inflammation and her father was also a pain specialist. Both of them focused on back, but rolfing, moving, self, self myofascial release. So again, Sometimes the information might not be clear out out there. I mean, I think now more than ever, you can find so much on the internet. But back when I was researching this, there wasn't any information on myofascial release. Um, So you have to, if you don't find it, you got to find it. So that's a big way on how I educate myself. I have had a couple of certifications, but uh, again, I ended up, I started as a dancer and when the industry was a baby, there wasn't much around. Now I think because there's so many different certs and specialty certs that it's easy to find as long as you're looking for a really qualified cert and it's not just a weekend wham mammer, which a lot of people do. I would encourage you to take the time to do the research to find the best certification in the area that you want to be an expert in. And then never think that that's the end game. You've got to continue to to find other resources of information so that you can truly uh, understand the area in which you want to focus on. I like it. I like it a lot. With Fitness Fest being a conference company, the importance of education, growing your career, those are always pieces that every guest comes on and talks about. So it's always great to hear those and talk about how you've used 
education in your career, where it's pointed you, all those kinds of things. And the next question I have for you, you've mentioned, and I know that uh, being a guest on this, you're a presenter at Fitness Fest. What is your advice for speakers wanting to get on this, the circuit? Yeah, it is a tough gig. And let's, exp- we talked about um, how your career evolves and mm-hmm. mine naturally evolved where I was, a lot of teachers were starting to take my classes because my content was very unusual and different mm-hmm. and, and I'm able to come up with a lot of content. And so uh, it was very difficult for me to get into a conference. I think I applied seven or eight times to idea multiple conferences. And I always got turned down. It's like, once you're in, sometimes it's, it's easier to stay in if, as long as you're coming up with innovative stuff, but getting in is very difficult. So I went a different route. I started uh, doing trade workshops. So if I went to vacation in Hawaii, I would offer the instru- the head of, head of the group X department in a specific area to do workshops for free for their people. If they would give me a massage or a dinner or any kind of trade, just so that I can bring, build up a repertoire, learn how to present, which some people just assume that, oh, I'm a great teacher. I can present. This is not true. It is a completely <laughs> different mm-hmm. ball of wax. I mean, when you're presenting to other instructors, the the level of presenting is much higher. Your uh, presentations have to be amazing and you have to practice them. It's not like you can just throw something together. Your content has to be great. So starting off, that's how I started is by doing trade. I went to churches. I went to uh, my club. If they, they owned three different clubs at the time, I said, can I do a workshop at each one of the clubs and can, you know, in trade, give me something, you know, either one hour's pay or, and, and then I applied for CECs so that, because continuing education is really important for instructors. They have to do a certain amount of education. And that's pretty much how I got, got started in the industry is by trading. And then eventually I got recognized and, and got into the uh, bigger conferences and, once once I got in there, I ended up with another issue, which is I'm an independent. So mm-hmm. I don't usually align myself with any big company and do the education that they create. For example, the myofascial release, nobody had myofascial release. I was creating it and bringing it to a conference and I wasn't being sponsored by anybody. Although I did partner up with power systems, they brought in like the first, they look like, they look like aqua noodles, the first foam rollers, they were like four inches round. But at that point, you have to also try and figure out how you can continue to market yourself. Are you going to uh, align yourself with a big company? so that they can promote you and you can go to a lot of these conferences or are you going to be an independent doing your own presentations and try to get yourself in that way? It's difficult. It's difficult. Oh yeah. I like your idea that you shared about trading, but also within your club. If you're a trainer and there's multiple clubs within your chain, not only is that a great way to get the experience, what you shared, getting that experience, standing up in front of fellow peers, fellow fitness pros, talking that language, using your big boy words, big girl words, and really diving into certain topics. Because not only is that great for practice, getting those reps in, but also yeah. if you are looking to grow within your own company, if you're working for a facility, they're going to go right to you. Oh, there's an opening position for our director head or a manager position. Right there, you primed yourself for that opportunity and the ability to grow right there. And your gym might be one of those that's looking to yep. get into speaking. And getting feedback, right? Yeah. Feedback. Because uh, actually, if you're presenting in front of a group of personal trainers or instructors that you know, mm-hmm. chances are they're going to be kinder with feedback, even though they may also be very open. Mm-hmm. Um, and I got to tell you, when you're at the conference level, at the big, at the big ones, sometimes people can be a little harsh. Mm -hmm. So you also have to have a thick skin and just concentrate on the things that you can improve and ignore the things that are like, I was told once, this is the one of the funniest comments I think I ever, um, many, many years ago. I, and if you know me, if anyone out there knows me, I have a lot of hair, big hair, (laughs) 
<laughs> just big disco hair back from that era. <laughs> and so one of the comments that was on my feedback form for, for one of my sessions was she can't be a real fitness instructor. Her She's just got too big a hair. Her hair's too big. Ponytail. What does that have anything to do with anything? But people will find things that, you know, interesting little things that they want to throw at you just to, because they want to, maybe they want to be up there and feel that they can be up there. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're not always so nice. So you have to never, ever, ever let the negative take it, take it as maybe helpful information. If it's a good comment, but if it's negative, you got to kind of just push it aside and move forward because they're going to hit you. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's very true. And I'm yeah. going to share something right now that I, I'm, even though I'm trying to think of how many podcast episodes we've done with fitness, I haven't shared this one because some of these questions are the same and because they're general questions, we want to learn from the presenter, get their advice on things. And one of my strategies, this is deep insight strategy here, since we're talking about it and potentially people poking at your your presentations is one of my tactics that I do. If you know me, I have uh, I have a couple degrees and what I do is in my presentations I have a, a part of the lecture where I basically just put the um, the citations for different research. And from memory, what I will do is I will give the abstract for it, but I'll break it down what that application is for. And but all they see is just the, who the authors are, the topic, but I'll go through it in such detail that anybody that's sitting there, they'd be like, how do you, how do you remember all that stuff? But I saw it in a presentation once when I was for my master's degree, I had to go to this conference and watching this professor do it for, I think he did it for 15 different different citations. It was one of the most amazing, wow. yeah, it was one of the most <laughs> amazing things that I've ever seen, but he just loved research that much. And so every time after, after I saw that, I was like, I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to just reference things like that. And so the, the, the funny part about this is though, that then I get people at conferences when I do uh, speak, they will then come up and talk to me about the most random things. Like, Oh, have you ever heard about this research thing? I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about. Like, even though I do read research, it's uh, I'm just talking about this topic, not some random thing. And that's happened to be a few times. But uh, that's my little insight there. If you want to show if you want to get in front of people, you want to make sure that they don't mess with you. <laughs> that's my hat. That's my own advice for you. But that's myself. Let's get back to you, Eileen. So another common question that we talk about on the podcast is about mentorship. Eileen, have you had any mentors throughout your career? I've mentored a lot in my career. So I think that um, in mentoring, you learn quite a bit. My first memories of people who really influenced me were my dance teachers, the mm -hmm. charismatic dance teachers, and the fact that they always had a class plan. Um, those were probably my big inspirations. They were the original people that I took workshops from uh, in the industry, like Candace Copeland and Douglas Copeland Brooks. Um, they were amazing at getting groups of people together with current information. Uh, I have mentored I don't know, so many in the industry that have gone on to greatness. And that's been a real uh, wonderful part of my development in the industries is mm -hmm. actually helping newcomers find their own voice and their own specialty and help them develop that individually. Um, I've mentored people like Shalene Johnson, who just got the Lifetime Achievement Award for IDEA. The, uh, that was pretty cool to have, have her mention me in her speech and mm -hmm. many, many others uh, that it, have gone on to really make a difference in other people's lives. I think mentoring it, it's so far down the road that I find myself mentoring more others than being mentored myself. Um, I have uh, kind of gone through that process <laughs> a long time ago. Yeah. 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 But, I like but, but searching a men searching out a mentor, if you're new in the industry, I would think is an incredible asset to find somebody who can help you because it, it can be a little confusing to try and maneuver through such a huge industry at this point that you, you may want to look to somebody who can help you. Yeah. Agree. Agree. 
And what I've noticed about a lot of the presenters and individuals that have been in the industry for a long time is that they, just like yourself, they enjoy giving back and mentoring other fitness pros, that they enjoy that process because it's their way of keeping the industry growing, keeping that wheel turning, keeping progression going, innovation. So it's always great to hear those types of things when I go on the podcast and I talk with others is that they love the process of helping others within the industry. So kudos to you on that one. Oh, thanks. Eileen, as we start to wrap the podcast up here, I want to chat about your upcoming sessions at Fitness Fest. Eileen has three sessions coming up. She has her Eileen's Aqua Blast on September 11th. That's a Saturday at seven. She has another session that day, killer core with the foam roller. And then she'll be finishing up on Sunday, time under tension, resistance tubing. So three great opportunities to see her, work with her, learn from her. Eileen, can you share with the listeners where viewers and listeners can find you online? Easy. EileenSharon.com. That's my website. You can find me on Facebook, YouTube. I have my own channel. I do a little bit of Instagram, but I should be doing more. And uh, if you just Google my name, you'll see more information about me than you probably want. I'm also (laughs) posting for Silver and Fit. I'm doing four programs for them a week, and those are also free. And um, again, always can reach out to me at Eileen at EileenSharon.com. Anyone who ever gets a hold of my email has the opportunity to reach out with me, reach out to me with any questions uh, for the rest of their life. So I'm going to leave that open at, <laughs> to your viewers or your listeners that they can always reach out to me through my email. I dig it. I dig it. Thank you, Eileen, for coming on the podcast. This one was a real treat for me to hear, listen, and the conversation is always great. So Eileen, thank you again for being a guest. Thank you so much, Tyler. I appreciate it. Have a great day.